Welcome to LOA Today. Walt Thiessen and Shelley Epperly here. Today is Monday, February the 4th, 2019. It is 8 p.m. in New York, 5 p.m. in Los Angeles, 1 a.m. in London, and Sydney, Australia is at 12 noon, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of LOA Today, your daily dose of happy. And Shelley and I were uh, kind of uh, checking in with each other before we got the show started, and we realized between the two of us, we're looking forward to the show because it's a good way to pick ourselves up, right, Shelley? Yes, definitely. <laughs> you got to find the positive yeah. way to say it, right? And that's what it is for me right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, no, all, all, everything's good. It's all good, as they say. Yeah. Um, this yeah. is, what's that? Oh, I was just saying, yeah, I just find it interesting how um, even though it's kind of a bad day, I still manage to not wallow for too long and just to kind of flow through it and get to the other side of it. No kidding. Yeah, that's a victory. I just realized I didn't turn the recording on, so I'm going to do that right now. Okay. Recording has started. There we go. Okay, so now we're recording the video as well. So, yeah, I agree with you. That's, that's uh, No matter what's going on with the day, if you can find a way to put aside the other stuff that you don't want in your mind and thereby allow yourself to focus on the good stuff, hey, that's a victory. I don't care how your day is going. That's still a victory, right? Yeah. So... This is a QA. and a um, People are starting to file in here. Greetings. Hello. So everybody's saying hello from wherever they're uh, listening in. Um, Jeffrey, Shelly, Nasha, Amanda, this is good. Okay. So um, if you have any questions you want us to address or any topics, feel free to type them in if you're listening to the live stream. Um, I had, uh, let's see, do I have a topic for us from the listener? No, no, no. That's right. I have something that I have to bring up with Cindy on Wednesday. That's right. So I'm saving that one. But um, lacking topics, we're going to have to come up with our own for now, Shelley, until uh, our live stream listeners come up with some topics for us to address. So I'm going to take a first swing at it, and it's going to be a really easy one because okay. it's one you've been dealing with all day long. What do you do when you're not having a good day? How do you get yourself turned around? Um, what I do when I'm not having a good day is I try to just do what Abraham says and just find that better feeling, better acting thing to do. Mm. And so, um, you know, sometimes that's just like binge watching some mindless shows just to <laughs> get your mind off of it and just chill. Sometimes right. it's, you know, pushing through something that you've been wanting to get done. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm kind of a stress cleaner. So like my, Kitchen is really clean right now. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> so, when I'm when I'm stressing out, a lot of times I'll just like organize or clean or mm -hmm. you know it just like gives me time to think without you know I think we all end up on our phones or our or our computers or our tablets and and sometimes you just need to get away from all of that and yes. just be in your own be in your own head for a little while. So when you're I think cleaning or, you know, going for a walk or something like that, it just gives you that space to do that without everything in your face kind of a thing. I agree. In fact, uh, you mentioned going for a walk. I got a chance to do that today because after having some really, really cold temperatures here on the East Coast, we reached almost 60 degrees Fahrenheit today, which was a wonderful shift from four days ago where we were at minus seven. So big, big yeah. change going on here. <laughs> yeah, we actually got... It's been a little bit of snow today. So yeah, yeah, I saw you posted usually, that. Yeah. Yeah, we usually don't get snow here. The last snow, well, I think we got some snow last winter, um, but it's always just like maybe a day or two, and it's like a big deal, and the whole place, you know, everything shuts down. Like, it didn't, because it didn't stick, but like, if it if it sticks and we get like more than an inch or two, like the schools shut down, right. and right. businesses shut down, and you know... It gets kind of crazy here because nobody's used to it. So. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. It, which it sounds kind of strange because Oregon isn't exactly a southern state, but that is what the weather is like there. And, I mean, I think there's sort of a yeah. temperate influence because of the ocean, the, the Pacific Ocean. But for, for whatever reason, the, the weather that goes through there is usually fairly mild and often it's often quite dry around there, too. Yeah, well, here we're pretty we're pretty wet, but in Klamath Falls, mm. when we lived in Klamath Falls, we're, we were high desert. It's like at forty yeah. two hundred feet there. Right. And and 
we would get like we had some snowstorms, you know, where the drifts are going up over your fence and oh, you're really? having to <laughs> double it off your roof so it doesn't collapse. And you know, so we've had, we've had a couple good ones, but it's just so weird to go from that where everything just keeps going. You know, you still go to work, you still go to school, you know, and then coming here where you know they just aren't set up for it and nobody's used to it. And we don't have the plows, you know, if it gets too deep and mm. you know, just so it's a little crazy up here. I only lived out there for one year, so I only experienced one winter, but it was a fairly mild winter, so I was kind of going based on that. I didn't realize the snow could get that high because that winter I was there, I well, think, you're, you know. You we, were, well, I was in Medford, you which were isn't in far Medford. from Klamath Falls. You yeah, know. yeah Medford, Medford's a lot milder winters than Klamath Falls. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. I yeah. can't remember that. I mean, that was like 30-odd years ago. <laughs> it was a while ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to mention, uh, Nasha had mentioned the book that uh, I did a book reading on in, uh, Into the Magic Shop, and she was really appreciating it. So I just wanted to say thank you for the appreciation. She says it's such a beautiful thing, just what I needed. Um, and it, it, it's, a, it's such a beautiful thing what the book does, and I feel such a positive change. Well, good. Congratulations. I mean, you actually made that change, but I'm glad the book helped you. That's fabulous. So, yeah, way to go. That's excellent. <laughs> Jeffrey. Oh, Jeffrey's giving us the controversial question of the week. And we just started the week. It's a no, I... well, Controversial question of the week is, do we attract the weather? <laughs> and I say it's controversial because we've received feedback on times, on occasions where I have talked about influencing the weather, saying basically it made people uncomfortable. So that's why I say it's controversial. Um my answer is yes, because I've had a lot of experience with it. But, I mean, do you have any experience messing around with weather, trying to influence it? Well, I have two – I have a couple things to say. I have a little story about that. But I have okay. – but I just have one thing to say about about influencing the weather. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's kind of hard to tell in this day and age because it's so easy to look at the forecast. So it's like – what what you're expecting and just what you're expecting through the season. Mm. So, so I, I think that one's kind of a hard one, maybe controversial. I don't know, but just like hard to determine. Like if you were just sitting there hoping for sunshine or something, but the, the little story that I have is when I was in San Jose, California, a few years back visiting my grandma, they were doing a, statewide earthquake drill. Oh, my. At, like, 9 in the morning or something. And basically all the schools and all the state offices were participating in it. And it was just, like, you know, a thing to be prepared and earthquake awareness and everything. So they were all just doing this drill, like, statewide. Right. And, you know, so we weren't really involved in it, but we, you were just hearing it on the news and, you know, on the radio and everything. And that day we um, were actually driving around and we didn't feel it. We were like on our way to go eat lunch. And the news report on the on the radio said that there was a small earthquake at like 1030 in the morning. Mm -hmm. And then that evening when we were back at my grandma's house, we felt another little jolt and turned on the news and sure enough there was another and so for me being totally into you know the law of attraction it was like the whole state was concentrating <laughs> on earthquakes of course we had an earthquake you know? I hear you. so I just thought that was I think I thought that was super interesting that's not really the weather but it's definitely you know something that would would you would assume would be out of our control well, I've often wondered, uh, what, given the way that weather forecasters give their forecasts, I mean, literally, if the forecast isn't dire, they aren't getting enough advertising support. So it's always as dire as they can possibly make it. And I've often wondered, yeah. you know, because of how the law of attraction works, I wonder if you get enough people paying attention to the forecast and how dire things are going to get. I wonder if it actually helps make things more dire. And I don't have an answer for that. I don't know how to. It's like you said earlier. I'm not sure how to measure that one. But I've often wondered about mm -hmm. it, and I've often wondered, too, what would happen if our weather forecasters uh, did just the opposite, which would be, you know, against form because they wouldn't sell as much advertising. But what if they 
what if they always underplayed? You know, oh, they, yeah, these things happen all the time this year or something like that. Just played it down and nothing to worry about. Don't even think about it. I wonder if the weather would be less dramatic. Yeah, I'm sure it would be. I mean, I guess you kind of look at the at the weatherman as like a, you know, all knowing of weather. So he's just like, yeah, it's gonna it's gonna snow. It might get a little slick, but you'll be fine. Mm. You know, like. Like, I, mean, I remember one particular you know, just, uh, video that, that circulated. It was a local news video from somewhere in the south. I can't remember exactly where it was. But uh, it was the, the classic weather person in the street in the middle of an oncoming hurricane. And the wind is whipping around. The rain is driving in sheets. And she's standing there with her raincoat on and being photographed saying, this storm is really building and uh, we're expecting all this crazy stuff to happen, and, and we're, we're dealing with these huge winds, and she's leaning into the wind and so forth. And as she's giving this forecast, these two guys calmly walk behind her in the back of the street that she's standing on, yeah. basically giving the lie to this big act that she's putting on. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> yeah, well, that's just, that's just mainstream media at its finest, you know? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I love that one. That was great. That one got a lot of uh, oh, a lot of love on on social media. I can tell you that. <laughs> but uh, so I kind of have a question that I could bring up. Sure. If you so just like with my um, what I'm dealing with today. So are you a are you a parent? Do you have kids? Uh, we do not have kids. Our, well, I should say our kids are furry and black. <laughs> they're they're okay. little kitty cats. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, and then you would you probably have a good like, you know, just opinion on this without being a parent. Um, so you have kids and you want to teach them the law of attraction and you want them to enjoy doing what they do, but you're also trying to guide them and then they just become pretty irresponsible because you've just kind of created this monster of do what you want to do and and then they just become you know super ultra lazy and don't do anything unless they're asked or told several times and they've made promises that they keep breaking and you keep letting it go because you're like they should just be enjoying their lives and this is the best time of their life so what's your opinion on that well, because I'm at my wits' end right now, and I'm I'm ready to be a mean mommy. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's not a fun place to be in. That's for sure. Um, I, I actually have some experience, believe it or not, because I helped open a school for kids. Um, it was an alternative school, uh, so I, I have mm -hmm. some experience in terms of working with kids. And this school was—it's actually a model that um, Abraham has uh, approved of. They've mentioned it on a couple of podcasts and talked about how they. They wish that all schools were, were very similar to this one. Um, it's a school where cool. the, the kids actually control every aspect of their day. And it's a very controversial kind of out there school for, for most parents because the first fear that the parent has is, oh, my God, all they're going to do is play video games all day or you know something along that line. They're not going to learn anything. They're not going to learn how to read and write, and they're not going to get their, their GED, and they're not going to go to college, and they're not going to get a great job. They're not going to become doctors and lawyers and you know, all that kind of stuff. So there's a whole lot of fear that the parents have. But the model itself has proven this model was started in 1969 near Boston, Massachusetts at a school called the Sudbury Valley School in Framingham. And the model is now called the Sudbury model. And we created a, a school on that model in New Britain, Connecticut, which we opened one year to the day after 9-11. The school wow. is... Yeah, and that, by the way, that was a deliberate choice that the kids made who were involved in, in the opening of that school. They wanted to uh, choose that date as a way to kind of reverse the, the negative charge associated with it. They figured, let's, let's put something positive out mm -hmm. there, which I thought was pretty cool. So we all kind of jumped yeah. onto that bandwagon. It's, it's fun to watch kids as they transition from public schools where they are told what to do where um, you know you have a teacher at the front of the room and the teacher is directing everything and and you know you're, the teacher decides what you're going to be talking about what what you're going to study who's going to answer what questions at what time I mean it's all very teacher controlled 
So a kid going from that environment to an environment where they can do whatever the heck they want to do. And they will test every single boundary because they're not used to that. They're trying to make sense out of it. And it seems like, well, how could there be boundaries in something like that? But it turns out there actually are. It's just not boundaries you would normally associate with a school. So right. if you think about it more in terms of a society than in terms of a school, I mean, there are definite boundaries in society. So you're not allowed to harm somebody else. You're not allowed to steal from somebody else, all that kind of thing. Well, the same kind of rules apply in a school. But to make it even more interesting, the kids themselves are the administrators. So if somebody breaks a rule, first of all, they have to have the rules in place. And then when somebody breaks a rule, they have what they call the Judiciary Committee, which is a committee that basically acts like judge and jury and, and investigates and decides what to do about it. Very interesting to watch kids who are trying to push the boundaries become responsible members of a Judiciary Committee. It, I mean, because that's not what they were thinking about. They were thinking about all this wonderful freedom they were going to have to do whatever the heck they wanted, no matter what the consequences. And now all of a sudden, they're the ones who are having to decide what the consequences are. I, I remember when we opened the school, the first thing that happened within about two or three weeks of opening the school is that one of the kids, we were using uh, facilities of a church, and one of the kids um, broke one of the cribs in the infant care room for that church. And so, you know, we had to do something about that, right? And the school didn't have a whole lot of money anyway, so it wasn't like we had a lot of money to, oh, yeah, we'll just pay for the bed or whatever. It wasn't wasn't really uh, an easy selection. So on top of that, the committee had not met before, so the kids didn't know what to do with it. So I was, I was one of the main people involved, and so I, I was actually there to help organize the first Judiciary Committee meeting. And it was funny because all there, were, there was the, the kid who, was, who had done something wrong, and then there were three others who were her friends. Two of them were her cohorts who were probably involved in the incident, but they were on the Judiciary Committee. And the four of them were doing everything they could to instigate me into making the decision about what to do. It was comic. It was like a comic opera, watching all the different ways that they would machinate trying to get me to be the person who would make the final decision on it. And I just sat there and said, "Sorry, guys, this you got to figure this one out. You know, this is not my decision to make." And you know, so they tried to go with, "Well, why don't we just you know skip it entirely?" And I said, "Well, that's fine, except you know, when you do that, the church is going to be pretty mad at us. They're probably going to kick us out of here, and that's going to be the end of the school." Well, they didn't want that, so. Well, what yeah. do we do? Well, then you got to figure out what you're going to do. And I refuse to give them any answers. And they were trying, oh, you would not believe, Shelly, all the different things they try to do in order to get me to be the person to take them off the hook. And I wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, they came to a very level-headed decision. But they, they tr after trying for like a half an hour to conv convince me to fix it and I wouldn't do it, they finally gave in and said, well, let's work something out. And they, they ended up having a, I think it was a bake sale in order to raise funds in order to fix the crib, which I thought was a pretty clever solution yeah but, yeah that works it, it's it's an interesting thing we as adults tend to assume that unless we the adults place the boundaries the kids won't respect boundaries but it turns out they will when they actually have full control because they have no other option it's a funny thing right it's, now, it's not easy to do. I'm, I'm not going to say that it's an easy transition from that to, say, a parenting situation. It's not because, first of all, a parenting situation is different in many ways. You are the one in charge. You are the authority figure. And second of all, you also have a whole history built up with them. So it's not like you're going to get away from all of that history all at once. I just simply yeah. put, say it to point out you don't have to worry. You can count on the fact that the way natural processes work, there is going to be a solution in there. And ultimately, from the law of attraction perspective, that's really what you want anyway. You want to believe that it's all going to iron out. Because when you do, mm -hmm. obviously, you know what's going to happen. It's all going to iron out. It's a question of getting your belief there. So that's why I was, I was sharing that story to kind of give you a little bit of hope that, you know, it really can all iron itself out. It really can. You may not know how it's going to happen. I certainly don't know how it's going to happen. But that doesn't mean it can't iron out. I, it, it probably will. I mean, the nice thing about it is my husband and I are pretty united front and we, you know, agree on things and we, you know, of course we disagree on things, you know, of with course. our kids and our kids are, both, you know, with, I've got a stepdaughter and then I have two. And so, you know, it's with each one of them, it comes with its different challenges and oh, yeah, I'm sure. rewards and everything because they're, I mean, kids are so, I mean, we're the same parents, you know, but these kids come along and yep. it's just, you know, stir it up and you're like, uh, I mean, I can remember, so 
so Marley was always, um, like Madison, you know, she'd touch something, I could pop her on the hand and say, no, you don't touch that, you know, and she would, she would go, you know, in her little, even toddler mind would be like, oh, okay, I'm not supposed to do that, I won't do that again. Well, mm-hmm. Marley came along and was like, oh, I, a challenge, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so it was just like a whole different thing, like, I, I spanked my kids, and when spanking, you know, not incessantly or anything. I mean, I know that can be a controversial subject, oh, but, yeah. but with, but with Marley, I, I, I just ended up not doing it anymore because it was like throwing gasoline on a fire. Mm. And it was, it was better to take something away, you know, like to take his favorite blanket away or his favorite stuffed animal and just be like, when you want to apologize or you want to act differently, you can have this back. And that's what ended up working. And so it's just like, this whole other um, way of dealing with things, you know. So basically, you know, he's made some promises to do some things so he can go on an orchestra trip in May, and we just keep, you know, being lenient about it and not pushing him to do it. So I figured that my solution to that will just be that on the weekends, until you have fulfilled this, you're not doing anything. You know, you're not having anybody over, you're not going anywhere, you know. So I just, I feel like that, like, kind of like what you said, like, that puts the responsibility on him. I'm not telling him he has to do it. He could sit in his room all weekend. I don't care. You know, he can sit in the living room with us all weekend. But until he fulfills his part of this that he promised he would do, he's not getting any more privileges. And I've also, we've also been very generous with, you know, him just wanting something and us getting it. And then, you know, having to tell him like five times to do something and he finally puffs and puffs and does it. And it's like, okay, that needs to stop too. If you want something first, you're going to do the chores and then you'll get the, you know, so it's just like, (laughs) so, so that's where I'm kind of battling with the law of attraction because it's like, I was pretty, my mom gave me a lot of freedom, but I also, when I took on the responsibilities, I took them on. I had horses and, and lots of animals. I had like ducks and chickens and, and rabbits. And at one time, I think I had like seven or eight horses and there was never, she never had to like be like, Shelly, have you fed your horses this morning? You know, like I got up out of bed and the first thing I did was take care of everybody. Like that's, you know, and like from like 10 or 11 on, that was just what I did. And I, and I love taking care of them all. Mm. You know, her job basically was to fight, buy the food and the hay and the bedding and whatever I needed, you know, and she was glad to do it because it made me so happy. But it's like, it's just a whole different situation with this one. Cause it's like, I'm trying to give him this freedom that I feel like he needs, but he, he has no, he doesn't know how to structure himself. So he's literally just, wasting time doing nothing you know and the phone and the computer have a lot to do with that it's a a whole different thing we didn't have that you know it's a funny thing that um abraham does actually talk quite a bit i don't know if you've read or listened to any of their stuff about um parents and children but they have actually said quite a bit about it a little bit yeah yeah um i i I commend what they have to say because i think overall their message is a good one um they Approach it from a number of different angles, but for the most part, it all adds up to one thing, and that is you as the parent are going to do better when you um, hold that child very high in your mind into a high vibration place and and uh, imagine that child living their life uh, the way that makes them feel happiest and makes them uh, most fulfilled and all that kind of stuff, all the things that we wish most for our kids, um, and mm-hmm. try, and, and they, they also encourage parents to try to not impose the parents' desires on the kids, but let the, the the kids' desires come out as much as they can um, in terms of what do they want to do with their lives. And that often means that, that this also ties into what I talked about with the other uh, school, because that school that I talked about, uh, I didn't really talk about what the strengths of it were, but the strengths are really twofold. First, because the kids are in control, uh, assuming you have a decent-sized population of, of kids to start the school in the first place, a lot of socializing goes on. And in that socializing, a lot of learning goes on. So 
it can be challenging, say, from the point of view of a parent who's so afraid that their kid's going to play video games all day. But what actively happens 99% of the time is the kids are playing, but they're interacting with each other and they're role playing and they're teaching each other stuff. I mean, literally, if you leave them to their, own, their, to their own devices over a period of years, starting at a very young age, every single one of them will learn to read by age 12, without exception, even though there is no official class going on. And if you leave them to their own devices as they need to, you know, maybe they need to, uh, they're, they're organizing a group to do something and they need to raise some money. And all of a sudden they want to learn how to do math. And so they'll have this driving need to learn how to do math. Um, the Sudbury Valley School has a really cool story that has been repeated many, many times, but um, they wrote it up very early on in their history about how uh, there was a group of kids, I think something like five or six kids, who wanted to organize a, a school club for some kind, of that, which happens a lot. There are lots of clubs that opened up for, you know, doing various kinds of activities. And whatever this thing was, I can't remember what it was, it required them raising money in order to pay for some stuff. So they had to, first of all, convince the school meeting, which runs everything, you know, I want to have this money. We, we, here, here's our justification. You know, we're, we're not going to just start this and give up on the project. We're actually going to stick with it, you know, all this other kind of stuff like that. But then they also be, had to be able to handle the money. And that's when they realized they needed some math skills. So they went to one of the staff members. Staff members aren't called teachers. They're called staff members because they're resources more than anything else. And so they went to one of the staff mm -hmm. members who actually happened to be one of the founders of the school and said, we need to learn math. And Daniel, being a very smart man, said, okay, well, I'm willing to give you some math classes, but what are you willing to do? And that kind of took him aback. And he says, well, you got to you gotta agree to, to uh, do this class three times a week. They said, okay, we agree to that. And you got to agree to do some homework I'm going to give you. Okay, we agree to do that. You know, they, they basically worked out a contract about who was going to teach and what he was going to teach and how long they were going to do it and what they had to do with their end and all that kind of thing. Bottom line, he took them through the first six years of math in 10 weeks. They learned six grades of math in 10 weeks. And he, and he was surprised how fast they learned it. And by the way, their method, their preferred method for learning was to take a teacher's edition of the math book and check the answers at the back. And when they did it that way, they learned it so much faster than if he tried to explain it to them. So anyway, they, they figured out how to teach each other math using this method. And, and 10 weeks later, they had learned sixth grade's worth of math. And he went to a local uh, public school system to the math department uh, where he knew the head of the math department and, and told them about this situation, what had happened. And the, the head of the math department said, well, it doesn't surprise me at all. And Daniel was a little surprised. Why doesn't it surprise you? I mean, you guys... You, you take ten, six years to teach them this stuff. And he says, yeah, that's because we have to spoon feed it to them. We're, we're trying to hold their attention every step of the way. So we have to take six years to teach this to them. If they were really motivated, of course, they could learn it in 10 weeks. And mm -hmm. that, that's the difference in the school. The kids were really self-motivated. So they just, they, if they flew through it, you know, they got it down pat. And that's the way it works. They all learned to read. They all learned to do uh, at least basic arithmetic. Many of them learned uh, more advanced maths. They, they all learn to, to write to the degree, the degree they need to learn how to write. And that flies in the face of the way adults, particularly in the education field, think. But the fact is, that's also the way humans are built. We, are, we come into this world with all of this just built into ourselves. I call it our internal compass. And it's very similar to law of attraction. We, we, we follow our noses and, and our inner guidance guides us to, you know, whatever it is we need to learn next. And when, when adults right. can actually take their hands off of that long enough, the kid will find his way to what he wants to do. So when I hear about a kid who is lazy and, and isn't wanting to do anything and so forth, the first thing that I hear in my head is, is that a kid who hasn't really had the opportunity to follow his own compass, who's been told, don't follow your compass, follow our compass. We're the adults we know better. Because that is a very common pattern among that kind of person. I've seen a lot of people who, who, who've been like that. Um, one of the kids who came through the school that we created, she was a foster kid. Um, she had a father who had basically left them, abandoned them. Her mother was a kind-hearted woman, but not terribly great at taking care of herself and a daughter. So they, they lived marginally, let's put it that way. And... The kid was just an angry kid. Um, she was on all kinds of medications because she was, you know, defiant and all this other stuff. Um, bitter. Um, hardly even was willing to give the school a chance. I mean, she did want to go because it meant she didn't have to go do all this other stuff that the state wanted her to do. 
But it's not like she was enthusiastic about taking charge of her life. She was just a bitter kid. And she was the one who broke that uh, cot in the in the infant room. So she comes right in and she instantly causes problems, right? Well, right. I'm, pr- I'm proud to say that we had a good staff who knew how to take their hands off. That's the hardest part with that kind of school. And they, they, they let the kids grow the way they needed to. That girl grew up to become the school president. <laughs> She turned her life nice. around completely because she was allowed to follow that internal guidance. And today, she is a happy young woman. She's living in a relationship. Uh, she's in her late twenties, um, and just she, she's just loving life. She's a completely loving, completely different person from the kid she was at age twelve. Just an entire one hundred and eighty degree turn, all because she was allowed to follow her internal guidance that she didn't even know she had. She didn't even know she had it. So I would recommend that you ask yourself to what degree are you letting your child follow his or her own internal guidance and maybe see if you can find ways to let that person do more of that. Yeah, well, that's that actually is what I'm going to kind of encourage by not having the distraction of another person that seems to take up a lot of his time. So... Okay. That's kind of where I'm at. Uh, yeah. I, well, obviously, I can't comment on that situation. I just know that well, in general, that's that the overall approach is you try to let him follow his own guidance. Well, so when he was, I gave him, I've always given him pretty much a ton of freedom. He's in drama. He's in orchestra. He loves that. He loves performing arts. He loves oh. art in general. Ah. Um, he loves animals. Um and when he was, I would say, from probably about eight or nine until about 12 or 13, he had his own YouTube channel. And he would do stop action with his little pet, the littlest pet shop toys. Oh, my. Or he would, or he would mold clay and do, like, a whole claymation thing. And he started, <laughs> like, he started playing with, with, um animation on the computer and drawing on the computer and stuff. He was doing all of that and he's lost all of that. Lost it in what sense? He's lost it in the sense that um, high school came along and so he is a lot more social now. So Mm -hmm. he wants to be off with his friends, which is totally understandable. Like Mm -hmm. when I was that age, I was, you know, my friends were my life. I get that. But um, I just feel like he's not putting any energy into any of that anymore. And it just kind of scares me because I just want him to have that creative side. So it's like, you know, like what you're saying, like, as a parent, am I pushing him towards that because I think that's what he wants? Or should I just let him do what he's doing? But you know, when you like, he wants to go on this orchestra trip. So we made a deal that he was going to make some money to help fund that because it's almost a thousand dollars. And and he told and he wants to do it by selling some things on eBay because he has his own eBay account and he's you know he's done that before. He knows how to list. He knows how to do comps for prices and everything. I've told him if he wants stuff to sell, I have tons of stuff to sell because that's what I do. You know, <laughs> right? So. And so he agreed that he would have a certain number of things listed and he didn't follow through with that. So my, as my, as a parent and setting those boundaries and making him accountable for what he agreed to, I just feel like my only choice is to take his weekends from him until he fulfills that. And he can literally fulfill it probably in an hour or two, you know, like, so it's just, it's just frustrating to have to go there with him. I, I fight with myself on being a parent versus being a friend because I really like to enjoy my kids. I don't want my kids to not like me or, or, you know, so it's just like this, this razor's edge that you are trying to balance on as a parent, like just trying to be and do and. If, if he, I don't know what the arrangement was between the two of you, so I'll make something up. Let's say you said you're going to provide $900 and he's going to provide, provide 100 or you're going to provide 800 and he's going to provide 200 or whatever it was. 
Um, right. So let's say you're going to provide 800. Have you considered the idea of just saying, okay, well, you uh, just want to remind you, you've got your $800, you still got 200 to go, but it's up to you when you do it and just let him go. And with the possibility, he might not ever do it. And if he does never do it, then he can't go. Are you okay with that? Um, I'm okay with that. Um, and we're going to talk about the, that tonight because we've already put a $350 deposit down. Okay. Because, the you know, they needed like basically like I'm really going kind of a, you know, we went to a meeting and they're like, okay, by next Wednesday, we're going to need everybody's deposits in if your kid's going to go for sure. So it's kind of right. like, and at this point I'm like, I am I'm willing to let that 350 go and just mm. give it as a donation to the booster club or yeah, whatever. I, I hear you. But, but, and I, and I thought about that too. Like you have until, you know, that money is due in March or April. And if you don't have your part of it, we're not going to have our part of it. And then you're not going. Yeah. And then the booster gets some money and we yeah. can just, yeah. So, so I've definitely thought about that too. Um, I'd actually recommend that over trying to control his weekends. Because that's more respectful of him being the person to decide whether or not he's really willing to do what he said he was going to do so he can do the thing that he wants to do. In other words, it's him coming up against his own desires. What's he willing? Is he willing to vibrate to them? You know, is he willing to feel them? Is he willing to live them? Is he willing to do all the things that you do in order to say, yeah, I want to go after this. Let's go do this. This is going to be fun, you know, or. Is he going to fight it all the way? If he fights it all the way, he may actually fight it to the point where he just doesn't end up going. And I would recommend you just have to be okay with that. You have to be okay with him doing it. Like, okay, well, you know, it's not like we didn't give you a way to do it. The, the way is there. It's, all you got to do is do it. It's up to you. But if you decide not to do it, okay, fine. You just won't be going. Simple. It's, yeah. it's not It's not you setting, It's not you putting uh, the boundary in place. The boundary is the fact that you have limited resources. This is how much you can give toward it. That's it. It's it's not like you are imposing a boundary. It's like this is the reality of what we're dealing with. That's what I did with that that judiciary committee that had to deal with the broken cot. Like I I told them I I knew how much money we had to work with and it wasn't much and I knew that there really wasn't anything in the budget right. that we could spend on it. So they had to come up with an alternative way. There there just was no other option at that point because the school was pretty cash poor at that point. It was a you know, it was in startup mode and you don't have a whole lot of cash when you're in startup mode. You know how that is. So, I mean, I just laid it out to them. And then I didn't try to solve the problem for them. I just backed off. And, oh, and they tried so desperately to get me to solve the problem. And I wouldn't do it. I absolutely refused to do it. I said, this is the reality. You guys are in charge. You know, it, it sounds so cool when you're the kids to be in charge of the school. But there's also a side that you have to deal with the reality. The reality is you're in charge. That means you're in charge of a situation with limited budget where we got to resolve an issue. How are you going to do it? And that's all I ever gave them. I wouldn't give them any more than that. And eventually, it actually only took about a half an hour, they solved it. They didn't want to. They tried every which way but Sunday to not solve it. But when they finally realized there was no way out, that they were the ones who were going to have to solve it, they found a way to solve it. Yeah, I think that's actually a really good idea. Is, and is, I, I, am, I am a control freak. Like, I do... Like I mentioned before, like I'm a micromanager and I'm like, you know, I tend to do that a lot with him mm -hmm. just because I want I want to see him succeed. I want to see him go on that trip, you know. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing you can do. You, you, you can use what you know about being a deliberate creator to imagine that and help support him in that. I, and that's a really powerful thing you can do for him. Because he has all the resources. Like I, I I've like spoon fed him, you know, like he's got everything he needs. It's not like I'm, you know, I'm holding a carrot that he's never going to get a hold of. So, so you've done everything you need to do. You can let up. You can just let yeah, up. You're right. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Amanda shared a comment along the same line. She said, I have two teenage girls and I went through all that you have mentioned, Shelly. I had tears. They had tears. It was all bad. And then she laughs. She says, however, my oldest has gone off to college out of town three hours away. I was worried and stressed about how she would, she would do. I had to let go and just hope for the best. I started saying how proud I was of her for all the small things she accomplished. And this built her up through all my positivity, and she's so independent now. Her marks are in the high 80s, and she is totally a different kid. 
Long and short, I've done an amazing job. Good for you, Amanda. I've done an amazing job as a parent, and she appreciates everything that I and her father have done for her. It will all come together. That's pretty good. Thank you for sharing that, Amanda. That was really good. <laughs> she also adds, Shelly, my daughter did the same thing for a $3,000 trip. Guess who paid for it? <laughs> Mom and Dad. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that's, that's where it's, I mean, you, you can be the person to bail or bail him out. You can be the person to not bail him out. That's entirely up to you, but it's also up to him what he's going to do. Yeah. And it's, that's kind of the battle too, because, you know, our other kiddo, Madison, she was in club volleyball, which was, you know, two or three thousand dollars a year. She, you know, wanted a car that, you know, her first car cost her like a thousand bucks or something. She she started working when she was 15. She started working at the county fair at the food booths and stuff and making money and saving up. And so every year she was paying, you know, even if it was just three or four hundred dollars, you know, towards her club volleyball, she was helping out. She bought herself a couple plane tickets when she had to travel to Arizona and and Vegas for those those tournaments and stuff. And um, and and the thing is, is like just, you know, talking about how kids are so different. She she did all she wasn't expected to do that. She just did it. And Mm. so we're at this crossroads where we can totally afford this trip for him. Mm. But but I just feel like. You know, you want this, you need to work for it a little. Like you, you know, we, we just, you know, like six months ago bought him an $1,100 computer, you know, and, you know, a week later I found it on the floor of his bedroom and took it from him and said, if I ever see this on the floor again, you will never see it again. Like you, you don't take something that costs that much and just leave it on the floor to get stepped on. Like that's, you know, it's just, it's, it's just a whole different ball game that we're dealing with here and so it is it's really hard not to try to micromanage the whole thing but well, to you be know, perfectly honest you the know, micromanaging I, part isn't him you know that cause huh? you are, you, the, the micromanaging part isn't him you know that i mean you've already said it's not him that part is you so oh definitely yeah oh, definitely. so we know that yeah. right yeah so because we know that we also know that the issues that are associated with it are not his yeah so Maybe give yourself a little bit of a break and say, you know what? I I really don't have to solve these issues. I really I know, don't have to be I that know. person. I know. Cut, cut, cut yourself a little slack I, there. <laughs> I put you in this tub since he was itty bitty. You know? So it is. It's so hard to step off of this habit because it is. That's what it's become. It's just like I just want to make his life as good as it can be, and then I get resentful because I'm getting, you know, in a you know, for lack of a better word, I feel like I'm getting stomped on because I'm like doing all this stuff and here have this and here have this and I want you to be happy and do what it, do what you want. And then, you know, he he'll pull something where I just feel like he's just like throwing it all in my face. And then I, and then I just get pissed. You know, I just that's how I was today. And I know not to even go to like him and I haven't talked all day. He stayed home from school today, which kind of started my, you know, my frustration, but I've just, we've avoided each other all day in the same house because I don't want to talk to him because I know I'll blow. I'm bet, you know, not so much now, but like earlier today, I knew I would have just went off the handle, you know, because you do that with people sometimes when Mm -hmm. you're super frustrated, you know? And so I just knew that it was best to just stay back and, and think about it and cool off and, mm-hmm. you know, like that's where yeah. the cleaning came in. <laughs> yeah, sure. Hey, you got to clean your house out of it too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that's it's the good thing cooking. to do. I mean, you, cause you know, you know what role you played in setting it up, you know, you created it. So, you know, it's, it's like with Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, admitting the problem is half the problem right there. You just got it half solved. You know? <laughs> yeah. So, okay, so you, you micromanaged it. So you, you probably overdid it. Okay, well, you could always back off. You could always relax. You could always choose just to pick the fit better feeling path instead of continually going back to, well, you know, he's, he's not doing what I want him to do, which will get him to his happy place. You could, you could actually back off on that if you really want to. You don't have to give yourself yeah. a hard time doing all I, that. And that feels so much better for both of us, I'm sure. Sure, of course, <laughs> yeah. 
And it's like Abraham says, you know, at all times you have the option to pick the better feeling option. So what's the better feeling option? That's actually the hardest question to answer. What is the, the better feeling option? That's the one that usually stumps us because we're so used to focusing on the part that isn't working that we lose track. You know, we kind of, you know, you know how it is. We, we kind of miss what that, that other thing is. It's like uh, my, my favorite way to give the example is to look at any political situation and recognize that no matter who you talk to, it doesn't mean, matter whether they're left wing or right wing or middle or whatever it is, invariably, if you ask them what their political position is on X, they will tell you what it is in terms of what they don't want. <laughs> invariably, no matter what the issue, it's yeah. always in terms of what they don't want. And you ask them, okay, so what are you in favor of? And they'll say, well, I'm in favor of the thing I'm against not happening. And then I'll say, no, what are you in favor of? <laughs> and then they'll say, no, I'm in favor of the thing that I'm against not happening. I said, no, 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 that's what you're against. What are you in favor of? And then this blank look comes onto their face like, I'm not used to expressing myself that way. I don't even know what that thing is anymore. <laughs> that's what it can be like. Yeah, it's you like, can get to that point. It's like that whole thing with, with Mother Teresa where, you know, there's war rallies going on. Right. And she goes you know, send me to a peace rally. Like, exactly. I'll go to a peace rally. I'm yeah. not going to go to an anti-war rally. Right. And it's the same thing with cancer, like fighting cancer. Fighting cancer. Fighting cancer. Exactly. Like, yeah. You know, it's like surrender to cancer and, and you know, work with it and work with, with your health instead of fighting cancer. You I don't know even, what I mean? I don't even like, surrender to cancer. Yeah. I, 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 would, I would pick select health. Select good health. I, I wouldn't even yeah. think about surrendering to cancer. I would just give up on the whole idea well, of cancer entirely. I just feel like, so I think I told this story, but I had a lump and it was good. It was probably the size of like a large marble. Mm. And it looks like there overnight. Like I didn't feel it one day. The next day it was there. I went to my doctor like two or three days later. She's like, oh, yeah, I can feel it. So I go home and I'm just like, okay, I have two two options here. I can freak out mm -hmm. and think that this is the worst thing ever. Sure. Or I can or I can just be like, it is what it is, and I sat there, I laid there in bed and had a conversation with it. Did you really? Like, Good for you. Yeah, just in my head, I wasn't like <laughs> but but I just basically just told it, you know, if 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 this is if this is, you know, if this is something that that is going to be life altering. I want you to teach me some lessons. And if this is nothing, if this is just a swollen gland or, you know, a cyst or something, I would appreciate it if you would just leave. Like, I don't, I don't need you here. I don't, I had an appointment to go get a mammogram because of it. Like a week and a half later, they couldn't even find it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. They were going to do, they did a mammogram and then they had me um, scheduled for an ultrasound like right after my mammogram because they just wanted to, you know, really get a good look at it or whatever. And after she did the mammogram, the the doctor came in and said, I looked at it and there's nothing there. So I'm not even going to do the ultrasound. Right. Really great. So I, that, that's kind of what I mean, like surrender. Like I just kind of like put it out there like, you know, if this is. If this is going to be something life altering, then let's just learn some lessons from it and mm -hmm. get through it the yeah. best that I can. And I think you what know, you really meant, you were, you were not surrendering to the cancer. What you really meant is you were surrendering the struggle. You were giving up on struggling about it. You're, right. you're giving up on being right. all worked gonna, up about it. Gonna, yeah, I wasn't going to fear it. I mm -hmm. was going to write it out however it was going to mm -hmm. be. And then, you know, because the doctor had said, well, just the the way it feels and stuff, it really just feels like a cyst. And as, soon, as fast as it came on, I don't think it's that, you know, and I'm just like, okay, well. And so, like, that night I just went home and we just had a little conversation. Yeah. And within days it was on, you know. So it was it's just, fabulous. like, very have you, cool. Have you seen the video that came out of China a couple of years ago, I think it was, of um, a Chinese medical facility. They were, they were doing an ultrasound on a woman – who had a very large uh, cancerous tumor in her belly, I think it was. And they had these mm -hmm. Qigong experts who were there. And while they're doing the ultrasound, you, they, you can see on the ultrasound where this, this uh, large tumor is, this large mass is. And then the, the, the Qigong experts start doing their stuff. 
And within about three minutes, the whole thing just dissolves while you're watching the ultrasound. Have you ever seen that one? Oh, no, I haven't. I recommend it. Go go look it up on YouTube. You can find it there. It, it's it's. I've never. I never really thought I would see something like that. And to actually see it, it was like, <laughs> whoa, that's pretty cool. That's a cancer mass going away, disappearing in front of my eyes, because the people who are involved are they aren't treating it as cancer. I don't know exactly what they were. They were singing something, singing, chanting something, and I don't know what it was. It was Chinese. But uh, whatever they mm-hmm. were saying was, I'm sure it had nothing to do with go away, go away cancer cell. I'm sure that was not what it was. You know, it was something I, much more health oriented. I'm sure, and they it, it just disappeared. It, it disappeared right off the ultrasound. You could actually see it dissolving in front of your eyes. It's very cool. Very nice. Yeah, I recommend. That. I was I was just going to mention really quick. I know we're almost at the end, but I just did this. Um, so this woman was on Facebook. And I think she was on the law of attraction changed my life. Mm -hmm. And she said, can you manifest a house in a day? And I said, yeah, I've done that. And so she said, she, she private messaged me and said, how did you manifest the house in one day? And I just said, we were in a position where we had to move. I was freaking out. I felt like I didn't have any options. And a friend of mine just reminded me to have faith and Mm. just to get real clear on what I wanted. And literally the next day we found the house that we're living in now. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, like I told the story, we came around the corner and the, and the landlord was standing in the driveway and we looked at the house and then a day later we were signing the lease. Like it happened like that, you know, and it was just amazing. So her thing was, well, I don't have any money. Uh, How do you do it? You know, we can't do that without money. And I just wrote her and said, you know, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. You're and right. money is just an energy. Mm-hmm. And there are lots of ways to get a living situation that don't involve money. There mm-hmm. are there are jobs you can get where the living situation is part of your pay. You know, yeah. the, the people that run the storage unit down the road that we rented a storage unit from for a while, they live there. And that's mm-hmm. part of their job is they get that living area, you know. And so, anyways, I didn't put all that out to her, but I just thought – it's just really interesting. I just basically told her you have to get clear and you have to have faith and you have to not worry about the money and and start feeling what it's like to be abundant and have more than enough cuz obviously she's lived in lack for a long time and sure. she you know it's just all about the money that she can't get there. Mm-hmm. I just thought that was an interesting interaction she it kind of just faded away after that. So. It, it, is it something how we, it's so easy for us to see in other people the thing that we have so much trouble seeing in ourselves, how easily we mm-hmm. attach to the to this negative thing that's going on. And we'll just argue for it like crazy. You know, we'll just defend it to the ends of the earth. But anyone else looking at it will say, well, why don't you just let go of that? <laughs> it's so obvious to everybody else yeah. except us, right? <laughs> But that's what happens. Yeah. Um, Amanda had one more thing that she wanted to share. I think we have time to get it in. She says, uh, Shelly, my youngest will be 17 in a couple of months. She started working when she was 15 and saved and bought herself a truck and pays her insurance and everything. It's all on her own. And now the oldest is seeing this. And we spoke just today. And she is thankful for the car we helped her out with. It was a hand-me-down. But she says she wants to buy a Jeep and is going to do this all on her own. She has learned so much watching her young sister have pride of ownership, etc. Again, more growing for her. Pretty cool. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I'm not sure that was Henry Ford. That was Henry Ford. Yes, it was. <laughs> I saw that just now. <laughs> that was the Ford quote. <laughs> <laughs> that's a quote that's come up a couple times today. Uh, there was another one. Oh, um, Louis D'Souza and I were talking about the book Illusions by Richard Bach this morning. We made some references to it. And he reminded me of one of the, the coolest uh, quotes that comes out of the book, which is, argue for your limitations and they're yours. And I, I think that just summarizes it so beautifully. You argue for your limitations and you just stay there. Ar- argue for your limitations and they're yours. Or I like to actually modify it. I, I usually like to say, argue for your limitations and you get to keep them. <laughs> which is really not what you want to do, but it's kind of like a, a wry way of saying, you sure you want to argue for those? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> that's what we do. Yeah. That's that's what limiting beliefs are all about. They're about arguing for what we don't want. <laughs> it's an amazing thing. All we have to do is just change it, turn it around and say, well, what do I want? 
not in terms of what I don't want. What is it that I actually want in positive terms? Not in terms of twisting somebody's arm or twisting my own arm or, or forcing myself against a wall or forcing somebody else against a wall. Just what do I want? What's the actual result that I want? And yeah, if we can look at it that way and, and get all that other detritus out of the way, all that other junk that we argue for, it's amazing what happens when we actually come down to, well, what I really want is just this very simple, plain thing that has a very high vibrational state to it. It's like, oh, well, just focus on that then. It's the simplest thing in the yeah. world, and yet when we're in that place of, of having that limiting belief that's blocking us, boy, it's the last thing we can see. It's a crazy thing. Yeah. Well, I just want to thank you for your parenting advice. No, you're welcome. <laughs> I mean, it, it always feels a little strange when somebody asks me because I don't have kids of my own, but I, I, I always go back to the Sudbury School because that was my experience with kids. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, it sounds like it was a pretty amazing experience. Oh, it was it was so fulfilling. I mean, the school never really got to a huge size. Um, I think at its prime, it had like 30 kids in it or something like that. But, I mean, that was... Just knowing that these kids were able to do something that people who go through public school systems don't have the opportunity to do, to explore, to try things. That's one of the really cool things. I mean, you talked about um, how your son asked for an $1,100 computer and then it was on the floor later on. Well, that's part of the risk of what you do with a Sudbury school. One of the best stories that came out of Sudbury Valley was the story of how, at one point, this club, this group of kids, formed a club to create a plasticine city. In other words, they used the plasticine material, and they started making buildings and people and so forth. They were modeling. They were making this entire city out of plasticine. And, and it was in endless detail. It was painted. It was, I mean, just really fabulous. And then when it was all done, they had a war and destroyed the whole thing. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and there were parents who were freaking out over it, you know. Um, another yeah. story is, is uh, and this is a real extreme one. There was the kid who uh, came to school, and every day, they, this was a, the school was on a six-acre property. It, was, it used to be a nunnery many years before, um, and that was a school. And it had a couple of main buildings. It had a lot of outdoor grass area and so forth, and it had a pond with a little bridge over it. And this kid would go out every single day with his fishing pole and go fishing in the pond. He wouldn't interact with anybody. He wouldn't play with any of the kids. He wouldn't talk to any of the staff. Every day, without fail, he would go fishing for the entire school year, even when it was, you know, almost close to freezing. You know, he'd still be out there. This, this is Boston, right? He'd still be out there, you know, yeah. doing his fishing. And at the end of the year, or, or the beginning of the next year, the father would come in and talk to Dan, who was the lead staff member and say, you know, my kid, all he did was go fishing last year. You know, is my kid learning anything? And Dan had to explain to him each year, you know, this is what we do. We take their, take our hands off. We let them follow their own guidance. The kid did this for like two or three years in a row. And the, the father was practically pulling his hair out. Finally, one day, the kid comes up to one of the staff members and says, I want to learn how to do math. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I want, I want to learn to use a computer. And the staff member was you know, aghast because it was the first time the kid had talked in years. I mean, literally, he didn't talk to anybody. And and so he's mm -hmm. like, okay, I'm not sure. I, I got to do this right. I got to handle this right. The kid's finally saying he wants some help with something. And so, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, well, in order to use a computer, now this was uh, back before the modern desktop, so you had to know something about computer right. programming. He says, well, you got to you got to know how to do some math. Oh, I know how to do math. Where did you learn to do math? While I was fishing. Okay. Well, you also have to know how to read. I know how to read. When did you learn how to read? When I was fishing. To this day, no one knows how this kid learned math or reading. But we do know this. He ended up as a vice president at Hewlett Packard. Wow. <laughs> now, that's a really extreme example. Most kids don't go that far out to the extreme. But it shows mm -hmm. even in the extremes, they follow their guidance. They get there. You don't always know how they're going to get there. But they get there, which is a really cool thing. Yeah. So anyway, we are actually past time, but this has been a good conversation. I, I love it anytime I get to talk Sudbury, so thank you for that. That's always a treat for me. <laughs> <You're welcome. laughs> thank you to our listeners. Thank you, uh, uh, Amanda, in particular, for, for sharing your particular stories. That was great, and we will see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.